Las Vegas, Nevada, the landmark of modern gambling. More than 30 million people flock here every year, hoping to hit the jackpot. They'll bet $115 billion to do it. And odds are they will go home with less than they came with. Some people don't like those odds, so they cheat. Cheating probably nets somewhere in the millions, if not tens of millions of dollars. And some of the most difficult cheaters to catch are the ones who know how to work the system best, from casino employees to people throwing the games and those trying to stop them. It's an insider's war on the casino floor. It does really boil down to good guys versus bad guys. If you're coming in to cheat and to get what's not yours, you're breaking the law and you're on the other side. In exclusive surveillance video, cheaters are exposed doing what they do, and security responds in force. It's Vegas from the inside. Some of the most common cheats caught on tape are fairly simple. Past posting is making a bet after you know the winning number. Operating as a team, the man at the right of the screen is working with the man at the top of the screen. In an effort to distract the dealer who is not in on the scam, the man on the right places a late bet that is rejected. With the dealer's focus elsewhere, the cheater at the top of the screen adds more chips onto the winning number for a payout of 35 to 1. Other cheats are fairly complex. Here, a woman strategically uses her purse as an attempt to block security cameras. Then, her partner in crime comes in to block with his body. The man seated is using a specially designed tool that's inserted into the mouth of the video poker machine. He's attempting to trick the payout sensor into triggering a jackpot. No matter what they know or don't know about security, cheaters always think they're smarter. Rest assured, the casinos are watching 24-7 and if anything defines security, it's the eye in the sky. I do believe there are more cameras in Las Vegas than Washington, D.C. So here in Las Vegas, Big Brother is watching. It's estimated that there are tens of thousands of surveillance cameras blanketing nearly every inch of every casino. And when something goes down, they will have it on tape. It's eyes where we can't be. So it's a force multiplier, if you will, for the security and the surveillance staff. Since their earliest days, casinos have tracked the action on the floor. For decades, surveillance was little more than beefy men walking the floor, looking for obvious cheats. But when cheaters upped their game, so did casinos. Catwalks were the big breakthrough. Suddenly, surveillance could invisibly monitor the games from above with the help of two-way mirrors. In downtown Vegas, the Hotel Nevada opened its doors in 1907. Renamed the Golden Gate Casino in 1955, it still has the remnants of their catwalk, the original eye in the sky. Operators got into the catwalk through a secret entrance on the roof. So there you see it. That's the cart that they were laid down face first on and then they push themselves up and down the track, exactly like being in their mind, because this would be closed so that nobody knew he was in there. While older hotels are renovated to keep up with cheaters, the new casinos are designed with security in mind. The Aria Resort and Casino was constructed from the ground up to be cheat proof. Security chief Ted Whiting spent more than three years helping to design Aria's state-of-the-art surveillance system. Anyone who's thinking of cheating Vegas should think twice. Because we're getting better at this, especially specifically at Aria, we're getting really good at it. With unprecedented access, we take an insider's view of one of the most sophisticated and restricted security setups ever built. Aria is one of the most technologically advanced casinos. We've got over 1,100 cameras on our casino floor. In the deepest recesses of the hotel's basement is the surveillance nerve center. From here, they can oversee more than 150,000 square feet of casino floor, including 145 gaming tables and almost 2,000 slot machines. We have seven workstations, about 40 monitors, and of course we have access to all 3,500 cameras on this city center campus. 
Surveillance has come a long way. Even I started in, in the mid-90s, and the cameras were still pretty good. Back in the old days, we used analog cameras. So an analog camera, they come in two varieties, PTZ, which is pan, tilt, zoom. And that means that our operators can move them. They can zoom in and out, back and forward, up and down. The other cameras that we used were fixed cameras. And those cameras are, are just a camera that sees one spot and doesn't move. So those are good. And they, we did surveillance for forever, for 30 years with those cameras, and it worked out fine. When we opened ARIA, though, we wanted to take the best of the old technology and blend that with the best of the new technology, which is HD cameras or high-def cameras. And what that allowed us to do is increase our resolution by three times. Now we have the luxury of reviewing the video. We can prove that somebody cheated, and we can see it a lot better. In this cheat, the cameras caught what was almost too fast for the human eye. The cheater seated on the left is playing blackjack and wins when the dealer busts. The dealer pays the cheater on his original bet, but the player flicks back the payout and then seamlessly replaces the stack, including a higher value chip placed on the bottom. Here it is again in slow motion, the flick and replacement. The cheater is indignant that the dealer didn't pay out properly. The pit boss is called over, they review the tape, and ultimately, the player is asked to leave the casino. A lot of times when somebody's doing something dishonest, they're trying so hard to act natural, and then doing so, they're becoming unnatural. In the surveillance war on cheating, one of the newest weapons is the 360-degree high-definition camera. Similar to Google Earth's ability to see city street details from outer space, the 360 system is like having dozens of cameras digitally combined as one image. This bird's eye view gives observers the advantage of going back in time and zooming in or out to see exactly what happened. 360 te technology is not used as a live viewing tool. This is strictly a forensics tool that's used after the fact. This is where we would go back after an incident has happened, so that way we can zoom into the picture and see where the patron has gone or the theft has taken place. And we do not miss anything on the casino floor. We can go back seven days and virtually drop into the image and look around and watch a patron walk from one area of the casino all the way across the other area. For surveillance insiders, the key to catching thieves is being able to identify them. Older eye-in-the-sky systems have lower resolution cameras that make it difficult to see faces clearly. To solve that, the ARIA's design and layout was created with high-quality cameras shooting at eye level. And by forcing patrons to go through camera-heavy choke points, narrow paths in and out of the casino, surveillance is guaranteed a clean face shot. We can actually grab individuals' faces and grab great ID shots. We have about 50 throughout the casino, so at some point, with you walking through the casino, we're going to get your face. I don't have a bunch of people, but I have 1,100 cameras. I'm going to put some of those cameras on choke points, which is the skinny part of the casino. So now we use these cameras every day. Had we not put in these choke points, we'd never have a, a face shot of them. We have a list of over 6,000 people that have done things that they shouldn't do in casinos. Before they even arrive in the hotel, we put them through a filter in our database of people who have been trespassed or arrested here. So how do we protect the guests? We stop them before they even check in. In this exclusive footage provided by the ARIA, we can see from the inside exactly how the coordinated effort of the 360-degree cameras work when combined with the hotel's choke points. The couple who are playing the slots walk away without realizing they've left a purse behind. Within minutes, they realize the purse is gone and contact security. Security will call and say, hey, we've got a woman who, whose purse is missing, and she was on row 100. We will track that back, even though it happened five or six hours ago, with our 360 cameras. So we'll track the thief back to the point where they stole the purse. Using the 360-degree cameras, they can literally travel back in time and focus on the exact area around the slot machine where the purse was left behind. Soon after the couple leaves, the 360-degree cameras reveal a man in a black shirt carrying a white jacket. He looks around, then settles at the machine next to the one where the couple had been playing. He looks around again, picks up the purse, and quickly conceals it in his jacket. He makes his way out of the slot area, but to leave the casino, he must pass through a specific path or choke point where the ARIA's cameras are focused for his close-up. 
we catch them with a choke point camera. Now we take that picture of their face and send it out to our security network, our surveillance network, and then we catch them. Almost instantaneously, the man's face is uploaded to casinos throughout Vegas, and in a couple of hours, he is arrested and booked for theft. At the Aria, the high-tech security system is a definite advantage, but the real inside secret to successful surveillance is having a team who can proactively ID cheaters before they strike. We can look at somebody and tell, OK, they're all right, or no, oh, that behavior doesn't make sense. When you see people um, doing things that they're not supposed to do, they behave differently. They give off tells. Just like a poker player is looking for tells, our surveillance people look for tells for cheats. A classic cheat found in Vegas happens when a player tries to swap or introduce cards from outside the game. Insiders call it card mucking. Here, the Aria has a mucker in its crosshairs. And card mucking is when a player brings a card in to make sure that he wins, and then he's got to get the bad card out again. So what they'll do is their hand will be flat on the table. So the other hand moves around and works, and they're drinking their drinks, and they're picking their nose, scratching their head, and this hand works. This hand can't work, though, because there's a card under it. Because each casino has its own proprietary card design, for the mucking to work, the cheater needs to acquire specific cards with the same design and logo. This is often done by sneaking them off one at a time or having an insider who works at a casino steal an entire deck for them. You can see the guy's manipulating the cards in a strange way. When he reaches into his jacket, though, we start to think something might be wrong. Now we see that the card it has left our, our field of view. We can't see it. It's obscured by his hand. Now his hand is attached to the table. It's a perfect example of a flat hand as a tell. Another cheat casinos watch for is known as card marking. We deal our games face up when we can, and the reason for that is game protection. If the cards are face up on the layout, the players aren't allowed to touch them. Therefore, they can't mark them, right? Well, that's not right, because we've got video of a guy right here who's marking cards face up. And he just made a mark. His bet loses, he comes out with $100. While he does it, though, he notches the card. He had a piece of glass attached to his thumbnail, and he was hitting the card every time he collected a bet or he put out a new bet. So he touches the card and marks it with that piece of glass. We suspect this person is cheap. We don't know he is, but we suspect he might be. So when he walks over to the craps table, we think, OK, we, this is it. Maybe we're going to catch something here. And yep, he's making late bets in the field, which means he watches the dice land, he sees it's a winner, and then he throws his money down. The funny thing is, when he's doing this, we're watching him. We're getting security staged to go grab him. So there was no question he was found guilty. It was This was easy. The video never lies. Once they catch the cheaters on camera, hotel security works with Nevada Gaming to make the arrest. We'll make arrests on the floor simply to send a message to both the cheaters and to uh, those who may be involved with them that uh, they're not going to get away with this. Catching the cheater red-handed is important, so speed is everything when it comes to the arrest. Remember the man who was swapping cards? We had security go grab him. They didn't grab him quick enough, though, and he was able to get his arm free. He reached into his jacket, popped the card in his mouth, and ate it. As for the card marker, the glass was still on his thumb when they made the arrest. And the past poster? Once outnumbered, he went down quietly. The gambling that they are doing is that whether or not they're going to go to jail and how much time they're going to do. You know, you get caught, that's, that's it. Do your time. If, if you're a criminal and you're a cheat, going to jail is part of your job description. There is another kind of insider working Las Vegas, and it's one that has casinos worried. It's when a dealer crosses over to the dark side. Even the most sophisticated tools can't always stop the casino insider who knows exactly how to cheat fast and cheat big. About 30% of our arrests involve employees one way or another. We have seen numerous cheats involving millions of dollars with the dealer or other pit uh, personnel. The story of one of Vegas's most infamous cheats begins far from the bright lights of the Strip in 2002 with a dealer named Fawn Tron who works at the small Saiquan Casino near San Diego, California. 
He was a gambler through and through. He dealt cards at Saquon for a while, but then he got fired. Armed with an advantage of knowing how security works from the inside, Tron hatches his plan to cheat the casino. But to do it, he needs help, and he's got it in all the right places. His wife, Van Tran, is also a dealer at Saquon, and her brother, Tai Tran, just happens to manage the Asian table games. Tai Tran knew intimately how each game worked so he could help develop their protocols of dealing uh, for security, what have you. He also hired all the dealers, so that's where his knowledge came in. The Tran gang focuses on mini baccarat, a table game where two hands are dealt per round. One is for the player, and the other is for the house or the bank. Players can bet on either hand. The hand closest to a nine wins. Rules allow players to openly track and record cards and winning hands. It's part of the game, so you can have a sheet of paper writing each of the order of the cards that are coming out, which is kind of how they got the idea of tracking cards, because you're allowed to do it. A member of the Tran organization tracks the cards. Then, the dealer, who's also a member, uses his skill set to pull off one of the oldest tricks in the book, the false shuffle. A false shuffle is simply making it appear that you're mixing the cards, but you're really not. This is Van Tran. So you can see there's a large chunk of cards that are protected right here. And as we can see, it's going to be on the top of the deck. So she continues to have a very thick stack of cards throughout the whole shuffling process where she's protecting it. Uh, let's suppose that you recorded the exact order of these cards as the dealer picked them up. The dealer's in the scam, and the dealer keeps the cards in order. So for this demonstration, I'm going to put these cards face up on the top of the discard rack. On the next round, same thing would happen. The cards would get picked up in order. Now it comes time for the shuffle, and the dealer would mark the spot and then shuffle to it. All of these shuffles will be fine. No false shuffles. Not a false shuffle. Now here's the group that was recorded. This is the only shuffle that will be false. And watch carefully. It looks as though I'm shuffling the cards. In fact, I'm not mixing the cards. After the dealer finishes the false shuffle, the Tran players at the table must wait for their tracker to signal them that the winning sequence of cards are in play. Because they know the exact order of these cards and who's going to win, all bets are dramatically increased. They only needed one person who really knew what the betting scheme was. So that one person will make a bet, and then everyone else that's with them at the table will make that same bet. All of a sudden, the entire table wins. To perfect their skills, the Tran organization does a number of test runs at the small, quiet Saiquan Casino. At first, they stay low key, keeping winnings down to a few hundred dollars. But eventually, surveillance spots Van Tran not following shuffling procedure. She is fired. But by then, they know their scam works, and they're ready for larger action. By early 2003, the Tran organization has expanded to include about 15 family members. Soon, they take their cheat on the road to Cash Creek Casino near Sacramento, California. Before long, they are making big money. In just one month, they clear $158,000. They want more, but to do it, they'll need more insiders who are willing to fix the deck. Because they went from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, they had to have different dealers cheating in every jurisdiction. They would go into different casinos, and they would just have a friendly chat up with, with the dealers. They tended to go for the people that might already have had a gambling problem, so they would pick out their vulnerabilities if they might have some financial situation or if they're just looking for a little bit of excitement. If someone is on the fence about joining the organization, the Tran recruiters get creative. Sometimes Van Tran would go into the casinos and kind of flirt with the guys, trying to get them to, well, maybe we could date a little bit if you want to try doing this cheat with us. And they would just play up that it's a great lifestyle, you're going to be so happy that you joined our, our organization, and all you have to do is learn how to do the shuffle. By 2003, the Tran organization consists of several former dealers and card trackers. They all have inside knowledge of how to fix the game of mini baccarat and conceal it from anybody watching. 
they crisscross the country, scamming smaller casinos, winning thousands every time. They will sit there for two or three decks, possibly, and then they will leave, and they'll leave the city or the state. The Tran Gang is long gone by the time casino accountants notice something is wrong. They have it down to a science where they want to know how each table is doing. So that's where the first inkling that something was wrong came from, because the table might lose 8% a night. Um, and all of a sudden, this specific table with this specific dealer is losing 15 to 20% a night. So they went to their video and realized it was all the same people playing. Since a lot of these gamblers that are cheating, they're all using their player club's cards to get the free perks that go along with it. So the casinos have a record of exactly who was playing at the table, how much they cashed in for, how much they won. At a gaming conference in 2003, casino security directors start to compare notes there had been uh, intelligence in the community that members of the Tran family and Fung Trung were up to something. One of the security operators at Cash Creek Casino outside Sacramento had noticed that there was a certain group of people that were doing something wrong at their tables. They think they're cheating, but they don't know exactly what. The FBI begins trying to document the Tran organization's activities. The gang runs their operation with military precision using cell phones and hand signals to communicate with each other. In this video, gang member Willie Tran is tracking cards and calling them back to a van where they are being recorded. He keeps his hair long to cover the cell phone earpiece. He would bring his girlfriend with him so that his girlfriend would be playing and he could be reading off the cards, but to anyone around them, it looks like he's just talking to his girlfriend. After months of honing their skills, they are confident and believe they are ready to cheat Vegas. They knew that Las Vegas would have been a cash cow for them if they could figure out how to get through their security. The security in Vegas is world class, and they knew it. In late 2004, the Tran gang pulls into Vegas, but their reputation precedes them. We were aware of the Tran organization, that they had been operating in California, and we thought that they were the possibility they would come to Las Vegas. We were not aware that uh, uh, Mr. Tran here was going to show up, but in fact, he was one of the ones that uh, was running the operation here in Las Vegas. In the video, we see Fat recording the order of the cards as they are played. After the false shuffle, Tran waits patiently for the portion of the deck that was never shuffled. Those are the cards they have the exact order for. There are three members of the organization that are sitting around the table, and Fat is on the edge, signaling to these guys. The cards that Fat had recorded earlier start to play out on the table. Here's how it unfolds. Fat Tran signals to the table that it's time to bet. The player in the center bets on the banker, knowing it is the guaranteed winner. Soon thereafter, other Tran insiders put down larger wagers on the same banker bet. This is an instance where they won $18,000 between the three of them. After the hit, Fat quietly rips up his handwritten log of the card order and disposes it in two trash cans in different areas of the casino. He doesn't know it, but everywhere he goes, he's on camera. Security collects the trash and pastes the Baccarat log back together. After three years of cheating across the country, authorities have what no one else could get, the hard evidence to bust the gang insider, Fat Tran. They were on him like a hawk at that point. In December of 04, they arrested him uh, for conspiracy to cheat, and several of his members, including the dealer um, at Palace Station. Their greed, basically, of wanting more money and wanting more casinos to cheat at was their downfall. Although weakened after the Vegas bust, the remaining members of the organization still won't give up the cheat, but once again, they'll need to find dirty dealers on the inside. They were definitely more visible. And then since they were spreading out across the country trying to find these casinos, they were introducing a lot of new people to this scheme who went immediately to their security and their supervisor saying, there's this group out here and they're wanting to cheat. The FBI also knows the gang needs dealers and are ready to help them find one. John, how you doing? Hey, man, how you doing? This is the actual undercover footage from the FBI sting as they catch insider Fontron trying to recruit a dealer. 
We have a confidential informant who actually was a former dealer that was approached by the trans. He got caught and now he's trying to work his off the beef. And he's introducing an undercover agent who is this other gentleman. The undercover agent is posing as someone that's a dealer. You know, what we do, surveillance cannot see. Here, Fung is describing to his prospective dealer, too, that you really need to know what's happening in a casino and what's happening with the security and what happens with the protocol to get away with things. You only steal like once a month. Mm -hmm. But Tron, like most crooks, can't seem to practice what he preaches. And in the same breath that he talks about being low key, he brags about the spoils of his cheating. I have seven cars myself now. Oh, for real? Okay. In May 2007, armed with overwhelming video evidence, the authorities move in on the rest of the Tran organization. Fawn Tron and 46 other members of the gang are indicted for racketeering, money laundering, and theft. Fawn Tron is sentenced to 70 months in prison and ordered to pay back millions of dollars to the casinos and the IRS. Tai Tran is sentenced to 54 months in prison. In January 2011, Van Tran pleads guilty to racketeering charges and is awaiting sentencing. Uh, we were able to prove that they had cheated $7 million uh, over the course of the scheme. We do believe that they took more than that, but we were able to prove $7 million. Not every insider comes from the casino. In the world of betting on professional and college sports, all it takes is an athlete who crosses the line to become the ultimate insider. Sports betting is big business in Las Vegas. In just one year, $2.4 billion was legally wagered at casino sportsbooks. And where there is money, there are cheaters. I would say basketball would be the sport that would be easiest to do some business with because you get one or two key players and they play a bad game or, or they don't suit up, that affects the game dramatically. Through the years, Vegas sportsbooks have had to deal with fixed fights, horse races, basketball, baseball, and football games, sometimes at the hand of a crooked player, owner, or referee. So the action on each of these games is closely monitored because an intentionally missed goal can cost millions. Devin Smith of Dallas, Texas, has been shooting hoops since he was six years old. My mother said once I laid eyes on it, that, that was my sport. And I just had to have a ball in my hand. At 40, Smith seems like any other weekend warrior. It's hard to imagine he was once the main player in one of the most notorious college basketball betting scandals to ever hit Las Vegas. When you're in your early 20s, and you're immature, and all you're thinking about is girls, money, and stuff like that, you don't think about the consequences. In 1994, senior Stevan Smith is captain of the Arizona State Sun Devils basketball team and a rising star. Pundits are already considering number 44 a lock for the NBA draft. People start talking about NBA, NBA, I just kept working hard, just hoping, you know, one day that my dream would come true. Smith wants the NBA and everything that goes with it, but living large costs money, and Smith has none. A young, immature athlete that's going to school, full scholarship, only getting four, five hundred dollars a month. Then he meets 22-year-old campus bookie Benny Silman, who introduces him to the world of sports betting. Met him as soon as I got to campus. He was always around the basketball players. But unfortunately, Smith is not nearly as good at gambling as he is at shooting hoops. Soon, Smith is $10,000 in debt to the local bookie. With no money, he's in trouble until bookie Silman offers him a way out. He said, fix the game. He was like, just control, you know, the outcome, so you can win the game, but just make sure you don't win by however many points I tell you. Oh, baby, you're gonna win by one, baby. That's right. 
What Silman is talking about is called point shaving, and it's illegal. At the time, Smith had never heard of it. But he figured as long as he didn't have to lose the game, no harm, no foul. You know where I'm from? You say, you know, gambling, you talk about shooting dice, playing poker. I wasn't educated to point shaving. To understand point shaving, you have to understand sports betting. As strange as it sounds, casinos don't care who wins or loses. They just want half of the gamblers to bet on one team and half on the other. Every game is not an even game. Uh, one team is usually superior to the other, so we attach points to it, so it, it balances the betting out. The most common bet is based on the point difference between the two teams at the end of the game. To make teams even for betting, every game is handicapped. A point spread, or betting line, is used to level the playing field so the underdog can be equal to the favorite. The point differential, or spread, is determined by Vegas odds makers, who are hired by the casinos to figure out how many points a team will be favored by. So that bettors on both teams have an equal opportunity to win the bet. Point shaving changes the odds when a player or group of players makes sure that their team's margin of victory is less than the point spread determined by the bookies. In order for Smith to get out of debt, Silman will tell him how many points he can win by and no more. For taking part in the scam, Silman agrees to wipe out Smith's debt and pay him $20,000 for each game he shaves. So I'm thinking, I can win the game? Oh, OK, cool. On January 27, 1994, Silman and Smith kickstart their scam against Oregon State. Las Vegas oddsmen set Smith's ASU as 14-point favorites. Silman and gang bet heavily on Oregon State. Smith fixes the game by slacking on defense. The Sun Devils win, but only by six points. Since ASU doesn't cover the Vegas spread, Silman wins. After the game, campus bookie Silman delivers Smith's payout, $20,000 for a job well done. Did I accept the money? Yes. I was trying to live that fast life. Silman and Smith fix two more games without drawing any heat. Flush with success, Silman lets a lot of people in on the secret. Silman's friends from Chicago and New Jersey fly to Vegas for the next game. March 5th, 1994, Saturday morning. Smith and his Sun Devils prepare to face the University of Washington at home. There's nothing extraordinary about this game, yet. In Las Vegas, college-age gamblers hit the sports books as soon as they open. They were like a bull in a china shop when they were making their bets. They just kept coming repeatedly, 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 instead of like every couple hours maybe popping in and making a play. Although the Sun Devils are 11-point favorites, somehow all the wagering is on Washington. In response to the lopsided betting, the point spread, which is also called the line, keeps dropping as odds makers desperately try to even out the action. The line on the Arizona State game opened at 11, and it dropped to three by tip-off, and that type of movement on a college basketball game is unheard of. Sportsbook managers are concerned. They check with the other casinos. They found that pattern of betting was only here in Las Vegas and was all over town. At that time, there was no knowledge that a crime was being committed. We just knew that something odd was happening. The betting action is way out of the ordinary. Suspicious sportsbook managers alert the NCAA. In a normal Pac-10 game, uh, regular season, we, we might write eight, 10,000, somewhere in that general area. But for this particular game, we, we wrote well into the low six figures. It was an unbelievable flurry of action on that game. At tip-off, the betting line has dropped so dramatically ASU can only win by two points or less. For Smith to successfully throw the game, the pressure is on. At halftime, Smith's fix is working. The score, Arizona State 25, Washington 23. 
Sun Devils coach Bill Frieder is given the heads up that something is not right. In the locker room, the coach confronts Smith, the team's captain. He was furious. Uh, yeah, I can't say it on camera, but it's some, some bleep, 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 bleep going on. Be afraid to get angry. After Frieder's halftime tongue lashing, Smith abandons the point shaving scheme. It wasn't even nothing to think about. It was over. Uh -huh. We went out second half and blew him out. Most observers reported this game as a game of two halves. The first half, ASU was totally inept, and the second half, they were, you know, Final Four quality team. The Sun Devils crush Washington 73 to 55. Everyone who bet on Washington is out of luck. Smith knows he has to face an angry Sillman who lost all of his bets. Since we lost the game, I'm thinking, you know, the same money he was giving me, I have to give to him. I go home, Benny's there. So I'm saying, don't worry about it, man. I got your money upstairs. So I was prepared to give him $40,000. It's like, nah, it's bigger than that. Like, what the hell are you talking about? You scared? <laughs> Ain't nobody just gonna lose and everybody be still alive. He left town that night. I didn't talk to nobody. My best friend, my mother, I didn't tell nobody. In Las Vegas, agents from the Nevada Gaming Control Board are closing in. After weeks of forensic auditing of the sports book records, they uncover evidence of unusually high betting on the March 5th game and several more ASU games before that. If you're taking advantage of the knowledge of the outcome of an event to then defraud a casino or a sports book, then you're guilty of fraud. Three months later, Smith wins Athlete of the Year. As for the scam, rumors of the point shaving persist, but nothing comes of it, and Smith thinks it's behind him. I thought I was gonna beat it. Then, in June 1994, Smith's big moment arrives, the NBA draft. He can finally cash in on his talents, legally. But now, the whispers of throwing a game are no longer whispers, and the NBA doesn't want to play with Smith. I thought I was untouchable, but that wasn't reality. All Pac-10 team captain, highest scorer in ASU history, number 44, Stevan Smith, goes undrafted. Smith spends the next three years playing minor league ball, everywhere from Paris, France, to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, trying to rebuild his reputation. It takes years, but in 1997, the Dallas Mavericks come calling. Smith's not the only one whose luck has changed. In Las Vegas, after years of investigating, the Nevada Gaming Control Board and the FBI crack the point-shaving case. They managed to work back through people that they had indicted, people that had given them information to one of the players on the ASU team. I didn't think it would blow up like, like it did, and, and it blew up huge. Who is it? Step back, please. And the feds came to me, and I found out the numbers, and it was over $1.3 million lost on the game. That was scary. Smith was in the NBA at the time that he was indicted. Uh, so it cost him his professional basketball career. In November 1999, Smith goes before a judge and gets a year in prison and a new number. Going from Stevick Smith to 01044748, you know, that was my federal prison number. I mean, that ain't real, I don't know what the hell is real. Smith is released from prison in 2000. Won the European Cup. They don't ever talk about that. They don't ever talk about the fact I had a 3.5 GPA, that I was the male student athlete of the year. I beat our field mix, who's now one of the top golfers in the world. They don't talk about that. We don't talk about the records I still have racked to this day, not only in the Pac-10, but at Arizona State. 
you just only hear Stevie Smith, the one who points shade. That's just something I got to live with for the rest of my life, you know? There are two kinds of insiders when it comes to cheating Vegas. Those who are cheaters and those who are watching cheaters. A cheat when he comes into a casino is very different than a tourist. He's looking for something. He's observing the dealers. He's watching what's happening. He doesn't see the lights. He doesn't see the flashing signs. He sees what we're doing and the money he's going to take from us. And here are seven of the most common cheats demonstrated in detail by our own insiders. These scams are what the surveillance professionals are looking for every day. Of all the ways there are to mark playing cards in play, the simplest thing is to bend the playing cards. I'm gonna show you an example of how the bad guys bend cards in play in a casino. You notice a high card and a low card, and simply in the action of either hitting or asking for a card or tucking the cards under the money, I just bent uh, the playing cards. You'll notice that one corner does not touch the surface of the table. That identifies it to the cheater as a high card. Uh, you notice that this corner does touch the table. That means it's a low card. Now, I can tell high cards from low cards in future rounds of play. Then there's the trick insiders call banging the paints. They call face cards paints because there's more ink on the card. It looks as though I'm just placing a bet when, in fact, I'm marking that little card with my knuckle. And in the simple act of giving this chip to the dealer as a tip, I mark the playing card. Notice as I touch that card and say, here, dealer, this is for you, I tap the face of the face card with the chip, and I put a mark on the back of the playing card that can be seen and identified in future rounds of play. If I see a bump on the back of a card, I know it's a high card. I would therefore know that anything without a bump is a low card. It helps me win by knowing whether I should hit if it's a small card or stand if it's a big card. But card games aren't the only ones surveillance officers have to scrutinize. Cheats can also tamper with dice games, like craps. This is an old school scam that was used to cheating at crafts called dice switching. In this example, I brought my own dice from home. This is going to be signified by the red color dice, and the house dice will be the green color. These dice do not have any one, two, threes on them. They only have four, fives, and sixes. The eye can't tell because when you put a die on the table, everybody can only see three different sides at one time. I'm looking at a four, five, six. You're looking at a four, five, six. The dealer is looking at a four, five, six. The switch takes place when the casino dice is passed to the cheater. He would pick up the dice like this, and then the crooked dice are dropped to the table at the exact same time the casino dice are picked up into the hand, and then the crooked dice are thrown down the layout. So these dice can only roll the numbers 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and cannot lose. Watch. 10, 12. That was a great one. I would have won a lot of money on that roll. 11, that was a good one. So you can see, these dice are very dangerous. But not all dice cheats rely on bogus dice. Some rely on good old-fashioned sleight of hand. One of the most common methods of cheating at crafts is known as a slide shot. This is where the cheater doesn't throw the die, it's being slid. In this case, I just want to slide a six, and then my partner or myself, we've been big on the field. The field means if a 9, 10, 11, tw or 12 roll, I win. What would guarantee me a six on one die, the only numbers that could hurt me here are the one and the two. Any other number, I win. And if a six rolls, I win triple. So when I pick up these dice, my thumb flips over the die, and I get them in this position. When the dice are thrown, the back die is thrown legitimately, but that six isn't being thrown, it's being whipped out of the hand. This whipping action gives the illusion that the dice is being thrown when in reality it's being spun. 
So if I take that six, when I throw it, that six isn't being thrown, it's being slid along the layout. This is definitely one of the better ways to take off a crap game for the simple reason is you're using the casino's own equipment against itself. You're not bringing in anything from the outside. Hand mucking is the art of switching cards in play. I'm gonna show you how that switch might happen in the game of blackjack. In order to switch cards, you have to have one of the casino's cards, so you steal the card in advance or corrupt someone to get you one of the cards. And in this case, I have one of the casino's aces. I add the ace to the game, steal the six away, and now, voila, I have the blackjack. And if I want to clean up, then I go to the sleeve. This next game is going to require a little teamwork. What just happened right now is me and Jason both have bets down on the pass line. As soon as I know that bet is going to win, Jason's going to take over. And I'm going to distract the dealer by asking a simple question at the right moment. Dealer, can I get change for 200, please? Thank you. At the exact same time when the dealer was distracted, I reached down and added money to my bet. And instead of winning 200, now I win 700. What you're gonna see right now was a different form of past posting. What you've seen before was me pressing my bet. I had a bet and I added more called pressing. Past posting means I'm actually gonna make a bet after the dice have been rolled. I have one chip palmed in my hand. That's the chip I'm gonna pass post, and that's the chip that's invisible to the dealer. So the moment I see a field one, the chip that I hold in my hand is the one I'm gonna ask for change. So as this chip comes down, at the exact same time that's getting slapped, that's getting dropped, guaranteeing myself a sure winner. But having an inside edge is not always enough in Vegas. Because here, casinos know their enemies and will stop at nothing to shut them down. The cheats will always try. I'm always going to have a job. And my main role in life here is to protect the assets. And by assets, I don't just mean the money that's sitting on the tables. I'm talking about the guests and the employees. So every day we get come to work, and our focus is let's protect this casino. <laughs> 